How's Your Wind, episode 1D. So at the end of the last segment, uh, 1C, of our first overall episode, How's Your Wind, we were talking about feeling good. We had talked about this kind of like hedonistic alternative to the path of discipline in athletics. And we outlined this dichotomy of experience that you have people, small percentage of them are elite performers. We also have um, a small percentage of people doing uh, highly discipline oriented behaviors um, and approaches to sport. And we're correlating that with performance and we're saying that elite performance comes from discipline and that we also have this class distinction of you have everybody else. I don't know where you really want to exactly divide that up, but it almost seems like the percentage of people who are elite in sports seems pretty close to probably 1% or less as we culturally define that right now. And that leaves the rest of us, the other 99% of the population, to sort of fit into this other category. And that's that hedonistic, fireball, whiskey, halfway around the course group. Where it's like if you're in that group and you're serious about the sport, well then the perception is you can't be enjoying that, you can't be having fun. And... That concept, right, having fun, how does that fit into this? You know, we bring with this the divide that the traditional view of elite athletics is that it's not fun. It might be glorious, it might be lucrative, it might be rewarding, but it's not something that we associate with fun or feeling good. And that feelings of fun and things that feel good are are self-indulgent, you know, I mean, that's also a cultural philosophy that exists, cultural belief that exists outside of sport, right? We see that reflected in, you know, ideas of like recreational drug culture, that like things that we do, right, that aren't like good for us, right, don't optimize our body's like maximum achieving potential. Well, like, you know, but those are the these things that are going to actually make us feel good, right? And so it creates this idea that these are things that are in tension one another. And you know, we've mentioned axial religions before, but certainly with the context of Christianity and other you know, axial religious views, you know, that's a core belief that um, the things that people will do that are self-indulgent, um, and even the concept of the phrase self-indulgence in and of itself is this idea that, okay, we're giving in, we're collapsing, um, we're you know, abandoning that sense of who we should really be aspiring to be as a person. And now we're debased. Um, And, you know, that's behavior is consequenced uh, in these ideologies too, right? You're going to go to hell, right? There's, you will not be rewarded for doing that. So like there's sense of consequence, right? That we, we engage in discipline now because we're eternally rewarded. And then we're saying that we see that narrative play out in our approach to sport. And I think that's really a great point of um, departure for this segment um, where we're going to talk about how do systems shape us. Because these systems of athletics, the systems of training that we use, uh, can sometimes be divided, and not unreasonably so, but be divided by sport and then be divided by a goal or target um, sort of discipline or aspiration within that sport? Do you want to be a 1,500-meter runner? Do you want to be a green jersey winner? Do you want to be an ultra marathoner? Um, Do you want to be um, an omnium um, Olympic track cyclist? Um, You know, do you want to be a triathlete? You know, do you want to be a 50, you know, meter, 100-meter sprinter in the pool, Um, et cetera, et cetera, right? We can look at these distinctions and then the idea is that systems are tailored based on those things. A different point of view, and this is the point of view that I want to explore here in particular, is the idea that our systems don't actually come from the idea of what's competitively the most optimal. That our systems actually come from a desire to, you know, enact a set of principles or a set of core 
cultural beliefs. And I think in particular, discipline is a key idea for this. All right, discipline is a key idea for this. Um, and that discipline model, right, we're saying, again, it has echoes of Protestant predestination, um, of sort of, you know, Buddhist um, asceticism, the giving up of things, right, you know, moving away from things as the path to sort of purity, right? And that is, that is a definition of discipline, is that discipline means resisting things that you want to do. And the things that we want to do, right, the opposite of that is hedonism. And that hedonism is a system, um, in a sense, although it's also maybe within this paradigm of thought, maybe it's sort of more of like the external anarchy in which people are lost, and that you pull people from that and put them on the path. I mean, if you look at religions that emphasize conversion and proselytization, like for Christianity, it's certainly the case um, you know, that there's a belief that, you know, you're a Christian or you're lost, right? And that to be a Christian is to be saved, right? And what are you being saved from? Well, you're being saved from all of these unchristian behaviors. Well, what are the Christian behaviors? Well, I mean, you look at like the list of, of, of sins and the list of, you know, commandments. And I'm not a scholar of Christianity, nor am I a religious person. So I don't, you know, pretend to be highly expert or knowledgeable in this, but just in that lay uh, person, you know, broad strokes point of view, it's defining that a lot of these hedonistic things, you know, are not really um, the purpose, right? That, you know, a Christian would not stop on pilgrimage and get, you know, raging drunk on fireball whiskey and, you know, go out and knock other pilgrims off the path, right? That would not be a good Christian thing to do, I would assume. So, when we think about this idea, right, what we're saying is when we look at systems, are systems really based on what is going to be competitively the most effective? Or are systems based on meeting the imaginings of what discipline is? Because it's not that the system is something that we describe as discipline. It's that discipline is what the systems are built to be. So it becomes this idea, right, that like by performing acts of discipline, that's how we improve, right? And maybe it doesn't even much matter what acts we're performing as long as they're acts of discipline. And, you know, having done coaching in some different contexts, I definitely feel when I'm in that coaching role have felt you know, and especially very strongly at first before I really started to reflect on this stuff, this sort of like anxiety of responsibility to like keep people, you know, engaged in these disciplined habits and disciplined behaviors. You know, I remember there was one time I had the runners, the group of runners I was coaching cross country, you know, I started a routine where, um, and we would start practice at the end of August where we would circle up and everybody would take out their water bottle. And I said, okay, we're all going to drink from our, our water bottle for, um, I don't know, it might have been like 10 seconds, right? And if you had an algene, right, you know, try to drink. And I would take my water bottle too. And my th- concern was, okay, everybody should be drinking water, right? It's like, you know, 85 degrees out and 95% humidity, and it's only 9 o'clock in the morning here, you know, and I want people to drink fluid. So, and I think that's a good, you know, intention, right? But like doing it in this like performative way, in this ritualistic way, I think felt good to me and it felt good to the athletes because we're doing this stuff like in this disciplined manner, right? And this idea of like organization, like imposing this sort of like social or cultural geometry of expectation on that is something that we do naturally, right? And when you see people lying around or seemingly being unproductive, Um, you know, that people need to warm up in the same way and people need to exhibit those same behaviors. And these are things that then I sort of started to realize I was doing and I started to wonder what's the value of this because I was looking at the performances because, you know, to be honest, when I first started coaching, um, the athletes were not doing very well. And so I wanted the athletes to run faster, surprise, surprise. And I think the way I started to think about that, in my case, 
um, happened to be not to like look to sort of like double down on the dogmatic things, but my inclination was to question this stuff because I had have had experiences with systems of training and sport that were not so productive for me personally. Um, even though for other people around me in those same environments were doing seemingly quite well, but they weren't working for me. And my perspective was that, you know, I should be able to do this, you know, fairly well, and I'm not. And I think for me, to be honest, you know, I was in a position where I could uniquely reflect on that because, you know, I happen to have some, you know, figures in, um, you know, my family. I have an aunt who went to the Olympics twice um, for Nordic skiing. Um, you know, my dad was a pretty respectable, strong runner, um, you know, when he was a, you know, high school and college runner and after um, college as well. And I have a grandfather who, uh, you know, ran middle distances at the University of Michigan uh, in the 1940s and was teammates with, I think, Bob Eufer, who at the time was maybe the world record holder for the 400 meter um, in maybe indoors or four, 40 yards indoors. Um, and so because of those reference points, I had this sort of expectation or this concept that, well, I should be able to at least minimally do blank. And I wasn't doing that. And so that caused me to maybe be more likely to question that. And then I also had like different ideas and different information coming from different sources. And so when we think about, right, that concept of system and discipline, for me, I started to move away from the idea of this sort of like, as we create acts of discipline, you know, we sort of like are developing our maximum capacity to be disciplined and that from that, everything else will flow. And I don't think that consciously most people are thinking like that. I would say consciously most people are not thinking like that at all, but we're behaving like that anyway. And that comes back to that premise of this, you know, multi-part episode here of like, um, what is the significance on the way we think and the conclusions we reach as a result of how we talk about sport? And these ideas are brought to us like formatively right away before we have any really other kinds of more complicated awarenesses of what's going on. So my first exposure to doing these kinds of activities um, when I was 10 I joined the YMCA swim team, and much against my will as a 10-year-old, um, to be completely honest. I was not pleased with this at all, and I remember, you know, having total meltdowns, um, you know, about having to go to, to swim meets. It had no appeal to me, and I ended up continuing to do swimming um, up through junior year of high school, and, you know, by the end of that, I was like, I just really thought the swim meets were awesome, you know, and especially because, you know, while also running cross-country and track, this track at that same time, um, the swim meets just felt so much better, and I felt so much stronger in the water. It just felt so good compared to the running races where it just felt absolutely exhaustive. And there's probably some interesting things, a lot of potential interesting things to consider there. But that swimming context, that's where I was introduced to the no uh, pain, no gain phrase because everybody's got to have their t-shirts um you know and in running you know when I was coaching cross country and you know when I was an athlete so over a you know moderate scale of time over like at least 10 plus 10 to 15 years of time um continued to see running t-shirts you know where teams would make their t-shirts and you know also one of the popular things was to have them say you know my sport is your sport's punishment Right, so that idea of discipline, right? That running is more of an act of discipline, and you know, it's that's part of that is coming from that place of like, how can we, as marginalized athletes or athletes who who feel marginalized or feel that it's a problem that we're not celebrated culturally the way people who are playing um, the sports that are the big money team sports are, like, how can we, you know, validate or make ourselves feel big and important, right? And say, well, our sports, your sports punishment is a way to do that, and. Um, you know, swim team though, was, I saw a lot of teachers said, said no pain, no gain. That didn't really mean anything to me at the time. I just have a recollection of sort of seeing that. Um, but you know, over time, 
Um, and I don't think it really took that long. You started to build the association that, okay, pain is this thing that you're experiencing when, when working out and that you experience that, right? And then that is predictive of the benefit, right? And so discipline, right? The path of discipline is to like take on acts of suffering and challenge and adversity, right? And the harder something is, the more productive something is. And I will cannot, could not say that I really ever experienced what I would consider to be like, if I'm going to define pain in sport, I would define pain as like muscular pain is definitely there and you feel that strain um, and that effort, but that doesn't really, that's like, can be striking and it can be intense, but it doesn't bother me. What sets off like the panic and the failure um, for me is the oxygen thing, right? The oxygen debt, the respiratory uh, deficiency or struggle, that's when it gets overwhelming. You know, when you reach that point of asphyxiation where you feel you're breathing through a straw, you just can't get air, that's really, I feel like, what shuts that down. And I've never, and not, you know, never experienced that more intensely than in running. Um, and swimming, it just always felt fairly comfortable. Or even when I was working, you know, really hard, I always felt really like in control and powerful. And, you know, on, on the bike and cycling, you know, I just have felt that it's always the muscles just become like totally swollen and like turn to wood and they just stop working before I can really get to that point. And so running sort of uniquely for me is probably the like most intensive thing in terms of that what we call pain, right? But so if that's our definition of pain, and I think that for most people that would probably be pretty accurate. I mean, maybe we have our own subjective ways of defining that, but pain being the body reaching that sort of like physical limit, right? And what is the pain doing? Well, the pain is, right, if you think about Tim Noakes and the central governor theory, well, the pain is the body like trying to stop you from killing yourself by accident, right? That like you could turn that off. And I think Alex Hutchinson's book Endure talked about an example of doing a study with some people on um, stationary bikes doing like a time trial. And I don't know how they did this, but supposedly in the study, they were able to take uh, the test group and like block the, those things, right? So some sort of anesthesia type thing where you weren't, you couldn't, they weren't feeling or processing that distress. Then they had like the control group and the control group outrode the other group because the group that didn't feel any distress just like rode themselves into the ground immediately. And even though they couldn't, you know, walk, right, they're really total muscular failure by the end, they went worse than that. So that that pain is like a messaging system of your body sort of pacing yourself. And I think what that suggests is that, you know, there are definitely like physical and physiological limits to what you can do. And I mean, that should be the most obvious thing in the world, but, you know, mind over matter is something that we hear a lot too. Or 90% mental and 10% physical. And that's some, a phrase that drove me bonkers for the longest time until eventually I arrived at kind of this aha moment, of an epiphany for me, which is that, well, you know, 90% of, of this, the mental piece, you know, is figuring out what to do and then, you know, doing it, right? Setting aside the time to do that, you know, not, not, you know, sleeping in until it's too hot to train, but, you know, you know, having the habit of, okay, well, I'm going to get up at such and such a time because I know the weather's going to be like blank, you know, or it's like, okay, I better like, eh, I better eat this so that I have energy tomorrow, right? Those habits, right? And that mindfulness behavior that makes it possible to, you know, be in a position to do that stuff. And then only a small stuff of it is physical because if you put that stuff in the right place, um, then that's where most of that momentum comes from. But for a long time, I you know, thought of that in the context of, okay, when I'm out here racing, like 90% of this is in my head. And I think a lot of athletes think that's the case. And I don't know what the actual like, um, genesis of that quote or that phrase is. Like the interpretation that I've come to assign to that might not actually be the point. The point might actually be to tell 
athletes that it's all in their head. And the only reason they can't go faster is, is that they're in their head. And that's really isolating, right? Because the idea is that like, if you feel good, you need to go harder. And I, as an adult athlete, still have a huge problem with this, you know, of like, if I feel good, I still instinctively react to be like, okay, that's a problem. And I push beyond that because that's what I was conditioned to do. Because, you know, as a runner, you know, for example, as a middle uh, high school runner, so I started doing running in eighth grade. And then, you know, as a high school runner, uh, you know, like you get told to um, compare yourself to other people. And then the paradigm is suggesting that the people who are faster than you on your team aren't actually like fundamentally better. It's just that you know, you're getting to a seven on the on this indefinite pain scale, and they're going to a 12. And they can just stay and they can handle that. And they're just taking on this other level of and that was really that was the explanatory thing. And that's how, you know, we thought about that stuff and, and talked about that. And that was like, wow, I can't believe they could handle that. And it's really glorifying, right? Because then like, you know, you talk about that idea of like discipline being the path to being superior to others, you know, here's a logic that really gets to prove that, right? And like feeling good was not a goal at all, right? Um, and it just wasn't. It wasn't something that we talked about. And I don't think that was unique to my experience. And I don't think that's something that's really changed. But um, as a coach, you know, or in a coaching like role with adults, other adults now, you know, or just trying to give people input or guidance or just throw out my two cents, I try to emphasize that we should be feeling good. And I think that it's possible to work hard and feel good and that um, it's possible to work hard and feel terrible. And that if we don't feel good, we really can't perform well. But I find that a lot of people really still lean into that. And, and the problem is like for me is I can recognize what I think it should be, but I still fall into the like, it feels too good. I start going faster because that's what my brain um, has sort of programmed as correct. Um, and anything less than that makes me anxious and, and doubt that I'm going to do um, what I want to do. And then I end, up, I end up just imploding and failing because I take myself beyond um, the limit of what I could do. And that, you know, the body will dictate to you based on your level of fitness and based on your preparedness of that given day if you really listen to it which is a frustrating thing. And that's something we'll talk about later in the later podcast as podcast episodes. What does it mean to listen to the body? But in essence, right, there are messages and there are signals there. And I think the problem is with sport is we're told to follow the system of discipline, which means not listening to things that are about feeling good because what is the model of discipline? Well, the model of discipline is that we can't do things that are focused on feeling good, because if we do things that are focused on feeling good, then that's the opposite of getting the most out of ourselves, right? Like we're not showing that, you know, we're, you know, predestination. Um, we're not checking off that predestination box, right? We are sort of falling on the wrong, wrong side of that Calvinist doctrine. So when we think about this concept of the way of pain, being very closely matched with the past of discipline, like what threatens us in terms of staying on that path is our ability to tolerate that pain, right? And that's a part of the reason why we can say these people are legendary because they're taking on this thing that we're presuming that we just simply couldn't do, that I could only get to a seven and um, the other guys on the team could get to a 10, 11, or 12, or a 15, and that's why they could do that, right? Run at these times and these paces. And I was just there, the perpetual, like, also ran, um, which in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. Right? We said, like, it's an unreasonable expectation for everybody to have this glorious notion that you're going to be in the top, you know, seven on your, on your team, which on the one hand is like a pretty low benchmark in the world of athletics, but it just, you know, statistically, most people aren't going to do that, right? If even if you're on a team of just you know 21 people, you only have a you have a 33 percent chance of being in the top seven, which means you have a 66 percent chance of not. You're far more likely 
to not be in there, even if all things were, are equal and they're not at baseline. And I think this concept of engaging with pain as the basis of system is really founded in not just these sort of bigger picture archetypes of what we think elevates us and allows us to be elevated as people, but I also think that it's founded in how people are initially observing sport, okay? And so we talked about how for Pavo Nurmi, for example, you know, the way he's training is a response to how people are thinking and talking about training at that time, right? That some of that stuff he's accepting and, and there are going to be things that he did that were different, right? But even that stuff that's different is in response to the ideas that people are talking about. And I think one of the ideas that people see is they like observe the competition and they look at the reality of the competition and what are people describing. And I think people are describing, you know, that it's like too hard to keep up and people are breathing really hard. And so that leaves people to form certain ideas of what the limit was for doing these kinds of events and these kinds of races. And pain, fatigue is the barrier, Right, And you see then again that Vince Lombardi quote, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Right? The implication is that for me, you know, I'm not the number one runner on the high school cross country team you know, or anywhere close to that, frankly. And it makes, you know, you kind of learn that you're inadequate in a sense. And I don't believe for a second that that was the goal of the coach to make us feel inadequate. I think, if anything, the goal of the coaches um, a lot of times is to do the opposite, to help people overcome this stuff and sort of transcend that, you know, idea. Like, And that's like the value of discipline, right? Is it supposed to help us get there? But then maybe what we're visualizing in that context as coaches um, and as athletes is just like totally unrealistic. Because this idea that people think you need to learn to tolerate the pain is absurd. I... Um, a couple of younger siblings, um, and you know, one of my younger brothers, uh, when he was in high school, he was really preoccupied with the pain and the suffering thing, and you know, he would go out um, with his buddy and you know, run and train, and you know, they would be trying to like handle as much pain as they could, right? Or at least this is the story that you know I heard after the fact, and you know, certainly when he was you know, running in college, you know, his sort of strategy of, of training over the summer seemed to be to do the exact same loop um, of about like six and three quarter miles uh, every day and basically would just try to progress his pace. And like, that's it. There really wasn't, you know, at least from what I understood that he was doing, and maybe I'm leaving things out, um, which I would say is not fair. And But my recollection is that it was just like, I'm doing this thing and I'm going faster every day and he would run and, you know, his fists would be like clenched together, right? And really like battling with that pain. But how much of that is a physical battle and how much of that is like a psychological battle with our own feelings of inadequacy? And, and then as a college runner for me, I felt it was just a continuation of this idea of I was looking for this like elevated experience and I found that it was like very much consistent um, with that kind of idea. And I don't blame the coaches. I think the coaches were good people, and I think they applied um, the paradigm that they had to work with. You know, And I think as a coach, if you're doing that, you're doing a pretty good job. I think it's hard to you know, try to find these things, especially as a coach, you have evidence that is showing some people are being successful and some people aren't. And like already it's the case that most of your people can't, you know, you know, be exceptional. But, you know, I found when my coaching, um, you know, one of the last years I coached, uh, we had cross country team placed at the state championship. Um, you know, with our placings for our top runners was such that if you combine the entire rest of the state in that race, um, in that state meet into like one team. And it was just our team versus everybody else. We still would have won. 
because in a dual meet format, cross country, if you go one, two, three, it's over. You can't lose. And like for us, if you combine that whole, every took everybody from all the other teams and brought all their best runners and made that um, the competing seven against just people from this one team, from this one high school, but well, we went one, two, three. So it was over. So, and that really opened my eyes to the idea. And we had been starting to see stuff like this before, but it opened my ideas to the idea that like, okay, like we can be a lot better than we need, than we think we are. And this idea that our system is going to shape us uh, and shape our outcomes. Um, and that like glorification of pain tolerance is something that I tried to stay away from, right? And to talk about like working within ourselves, right? And like, you know, we're not out there trying to die, okay? You know, don't die, right? This system of like pushing yourself to the point of like living death, right? And that's the only context, by the way, in which it's acceptable to talk about, you know, how uncomfortable you are. We're allowed to talk about, you know, our failing as long as it's in the self-deprecating, you know, I was dead, I was eating shit, it was so bad, like, and there's so many, like, ways to reference that, you know, or I was getting crushed, or I was going backwards, or I was tying up, or I was rigging up, right, reference to rigor mortis, right, you know, and like, that struggle is real, but it's not the enemy, right? That struggle is sort of where you enter into in the final phase. You know, probably five-sevenths of anything you do should feel pretty good. And I think that five-sevenths rule is, is a, I mean, it's not literally mathematically specific, but, you know, as a con- general conceptual understanding, probably has a lot of utility, um, a lot of potential use, right? How do we look at this stuff? Right, so it's acceptable to talk about it in that way, but if you're like, well, if you try to be more matter of fact or more sort of push back on it because of those things, and people are like, no, 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 right? Like you need to get to that point, and then either you tolerate it or you don't. You know, versus for me, it's become more a recognition of like maybe you know this act of discipline is not really what it is, and if there is a a discipline, it's the self-discipline to like not fall into the trap of those narratives and to recognize that like the body performs best and we perform best as people when we feel good, right? So this systems are also going to be influenced by traditions and entitlements around sport. And so it's one thing to say that, well, the paradigm shift here is that we need to feel good while, you know, being consistent and being habit-driven in our approach to sport. And that it's sometimes hard to be habit-driven because there's so many opportunities for instant gratification or compelling alternatives to, you know, using our time and energy to train that, you know, it can make training feel like this, like, monumental task that takes this Herculean level of discipline to achieve, but when really it's just, you know, our, our short-term self-management or mismanagement, like maybe we didn't sleep enough, right, or all of a sudden some really cool thing comes up, then it becomes, you know, hard. And if we have habits and if we have a healthy relationship, you know, with exercise and with sport, and we're like, well, this is a part of how I feel good and I, and like I'm fundamentally motivated to do it because it makes me feel good, it's a lot easier to, you know, balance that stuff out. And my feeling is that when people are at that point, it's not a struggle to train. You're going to train because you want to do that. So instead of being like, I want to decide between this thing that's fun on the other hand versus training, you know, that that's not really the, that's not really the decision because training is fun if you're doing it correctly. And if it's not, and I'm totally sincere when I say this, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. It doesn't mean that you you shouldn't do it. It doesn't mean it's not for you. It means you're doing it wrong. But our emphasis on tradition and our entitlement to experience that tradition is really a complicating factor to this because it limits our ability to move the system in any given direction because people want to experience their idea of the sport right they're drawn to cycling they're drawn to running swimming triathlon you know whatever these basketball right we've referenced that 
a little bit so we can throw that out there again. But people are drawn to these things because of their expectation of what the experience is, okay? And um, that's very different than when you get into it. It's like people who want to go to war. Like, that's stupid. I'm sorry. Um, well, actually, I'm not sorry. People who want to go to war um, and do that, like, because they think it's fun and exciting, that's just stupid. That's wrong, okay? Um, it's, it's not, that's not correct. Um, it, you know, war is random carnage and death. You know, that myth of survival, like, you can't, you know, train to, you know, be immune. And there's a lot of, you know, stuff that explores war, um, you know, because of that. You know, you think of, like, all quiet on the Western Front. And, you know, like, that was banned in, in Nazi Germany because of its anti-war, you know, message. They didn't want people to think about the fact that, you know, war is a random, awful thing, right? They wanted that glorious experience. And, and people have that expectation of things, and it will cause them to do things that are stupid. You know, we think about the idea of people smoking cigarettes to treat asthma. I mean, people are capable of believing all kinds of things, right? If people can smoke cigarettes and be convinced that that's somehow helping them with a respiratory illness, which should be, you would think, self-evidently illogical and disprovable, then, like, people can probably believe anything. And it's also true that people see in these sports, um, like, a rite of passage, and they want the social benefit of the transformation that comes from being perceived to have passed through that rite of passage's liminal space. And that pain and that suffering we see, like, anthropologically is so often, right, that, like, hardship is a separator because it's something that you have to overcome, right? And so it has to be difficult. It has to be adversity for there to be growth, right? And that's not, that's interesting because it's true that that's necessary, right? But that that adversity, really, when we think about performance and like what the optimal system should be, it should be where the adversity is like necessary and it's like effective and it's constructive versus this like backwards belief, which is just like, oh, if we create adversity, there'll be transformation. Like a lot of cultural transformation through rites of passage, like create an adversity, they have people experience, and then the culture decides that there's a transformation, but there's no actually like empirical, measurable transformation, right? And you get the whole the real versus the really real with this stuff. Um, but so like if you try to improve or alter these experiences, um, you know, even if you're doing it to make it better, like that means you've changed it and that means it's different. And people like want to be fast or they want to have a good experience, but they want to do it by meeting their their traditional expectation that they think they're entitled to sort of go through this rite of passage, right? And it seems like men, behaviorally what it looks like is many people will just, you know, beat their head against the wall endlessly because they'd rather just try to do it the traditional way so that they can have that experience than do it totally differently or let go of a lot of those system expectations, systems of training expectations and then actually get the results that they want. And that's really interesting to observe because if it's different, it's no longer the same, and then it's no longer what they wanted. So, you know, these sports exist and are defined by the systems that um, are used to dictate how people compete in them and how people prepare to participate and compete in them. And that's what the sport is. And when you change it, then it's becoming something different, okay? And that the sport, as a sport, is different from the idea of performance within that sport. So how do we learn these kinds of things? Because I think by the time you got to like post-war, and by post-war, I think maybe at this point we should start clarifying when we say post-war that we should be remaining World War II, um, by like post-war, it wasn't really acceptable to change the sport anymore. It was like most of the ideas about sport that I that you still see commonly practiced today um, seem to have existed before um, World War II. Like interval training and the idea of like recoveries before interval training, um, which I want to associate with Haig 
and Anderson, who were, you know, runners around that time in the 30s or the 40s, you know, pushing for that uh, four-minute mile, although they did not get there. But I think this was around the time, and I can't remember the researcher's name, but, like, stuff was being done with heart rate and, like, this paradigm of letting the heart rate come back down to 120, you know, before doing the next interval was, like, a really important breakthrough, but as a way of just sort of optimizing this stuff. Um, and I think because these were fit people, it, it led to this idea of, like, really short recoveries of about 60 seconds, which, you know, isn't necessarily effective for people. You know, it wasn't effective for me to run 400s, you know, way faster than I was actually racing the mile and then only have a 60-second recovery. I, you, you know, it was impressive to me in hindsight that I could actually do the session, but then, you know, go to the meet and it was a disaster. And I used to think that the problem was that I couldn't handle riding the bus to the meet. And that, like, by sitting on the bus, it ruined my legs. And it just shows, like, how this system, right, was, like, shaping how I could think. Because I couldn't even consider the possibility that, like, oh, the training is, like, not working for me and I have too much fatigue from that. It was, no, it must be the bus, right? And, you know, I don't honestly remember if I figured that out in college, I think I didn't really figure that out until after the fact. And now it's like, man, how could I have thought that was the case? But high school runners still do pretty commonly, you know, like, you know, 12 times 400 or 6 by 800, maybe even sprinting a 200 meter at the end, you know, to train for 5,000 meter cross country. You know, and into the 70s and, and, and 80s, and I'm sure for longer in some areas, it was still, you know, common practice to go out and run the course you know, every day, and that's what you did for cross-country practice, right? That idea of, like, being specific to their expectation of how can we as di directly engage with the reality of the competition as possible, right? So it's really, again, no different from that idea, right? Practice the event, you know, and for us, the team I coached, and, you know, it would be, we might go and we might run, you know, two by 4,000 meters, at what I thought was a tempo that was a little bit slower than what they could race for 10 miles. And then we might go out and run six or eight miles. And then we'd come back and we'd run some maybe six to eight 200s with an easy 200 jog. And we do those at, you know, an effort that was faster, but maybe closer to 3,000 meter or 1,600 meter pace than actual race pace. And so at no point were we touching on, you know, trying to recreate um, the race experience, um, and that, you know, worked pretty effectively. We definitely outperformed people um, in that Petri dish of sport that was, uh, you know, that cross-country racing league. And, you know, with cycling, you know, the idea of, like, doing two by 20-minute intervals, you know, at FTP, you know, you can do that, but can you do that every week, you know, for five months? You know, and if you can, that's great. But if you can't, that doesn't mean that you can't be just as good. You know, why not just do something else? You know, there's no magic workouts, but the system suggests there are work magic workouts because workouts also become a rite of passage. And the only original point of these kinds of like intervals training, um, right, and then you could ask the question of like, has the power meter like ruined cycling in some ways, which I think arguably is overall would be inaccurate you know, on a specific scale, because you can point to people who clearly have benefited, right, from that. But the sort of mass proliferation of power meter coupled with this sort of discipline system perspective, you know, does that sort of just push that cycling into kind of that same space with the running of like, the more you go out there, and, you know, embrace pain, right, you can do that. My high school cross country locker room was plastered with Steve Prefontaine quotes, which I think, you know, those quotes sort of got at that same idea of you have to go out there and embrace, you know, that, you know, pain and that, you know, for pre-articulating, um, you know, this idea of like, well, you know, he's separating himself from others because he can handle the pain or he has the most guts. And it's, you know, I mean, apart from the fact that it's unfortunate anytime people die um, young or if people die at all. But it's unfortunate specifically, you know, that, you know, Pri hasn't, wasn't able to live a full life because it would have been really interesting to know 
like how did his perspectives evolve over time? Uh, but instead, we're sort of left with this sort of like icon, right? Um, and we also see this system debate play out in the Franz Stompfel versus Percy Cerruti thing, where Stompfel coaching Roger Bannister, right, doing really algorithmic, you know, interval training with their repeat 400s, you know, working down towards the four minute mile tempo. Right versus if you read it, Percy Cerruti, who's just less known, partly because his ideas about training were not things that are easily packaged. Right, and that's that market consumer bias. Is a lot of the stuff that we hear about training is stuff that's circulated because it's the easiest for us to understand and share with other people. Whereas for Percy Cerruti, you're looking at a more nebulous conceptual understanding of how to do this stuff. And a lot of that was him thinking about uh, the geography of the environment he was in, right? And and designing a concept of training around interacting with that space. And, you know, for me as a coach and as an athlete, I try to think about that too, of like, how can we like take advantage of the geography and the topography that we're in, right? Not all eight mile runs are created equal and like one of the concepts I tried to use was like for long runs and my brother uh, my youngest brother calls this the gold standard now I don't know if he it's because he got this from me or if he just reached this conclusion independently but you know from I'd say like a hundred feet of climbing per mile was the goal with our long runs you know so they would run these you know 18 mile long runs on Mondays but they would also try to cover as close to 1800 feet as possible. And, you know, my brother says for riding his bike that, you know, 100 feet per mile riding is like the gold, the gold standard for good training. It doesn't mean you do it all the time, but if you're doing that, that's quite rigorous and that's really going to push you. You know, we also see like, you know, that people are still angry about 100 mile weeks, you know, and people use that as like an ugly stick. And it's sort of like this leverage of ignorance. And it's like the disciplined crowd really hates the 100 mile weeks because I think it took away from their like pain based interval world Um, because it's like basically saying, well, we're going to master or take control of this repetition training and we are going to dominate the pain, right? We're going to realize that we can basically overcome that barrier through this different strategy of building up our aerobic system. Right, and that was why that was so revolutionary, because there's this recognition that the the limiting factor here isn't our ability to handle pain, but that the pain itself is the limiting factor. So what we need to do is not experience that level of distress. And so, right for Arthur Lydiard arriving at this epiphany that when you do this particular kind of training, you can now be at speed and not experience that distress. So as velocity increases pain does not increase. And this is what I didn't know, right, as a swimmer, and I didn't know as a younger runner, younger athlete, um, I didn't know that that was the case. And in cycling, I didn't really do cycling racing at all until after graduate school. Um, I just did it as like, you know, we went ham sometimes, but it was like just a part of the sort of like spring, summer you know, athletic experience and was, you know, done around the running training, um, especially in the summer. Um, and it was just, you know, but even that, like, we weren't really thinking about like this kind of like net aerobic thing. The hundred miles a week is just the concept that's accessible. And you need a concept like that if you want to engage a larger audience, but then people take it as if like, that's all you need to understand. And like when you really look at it, the reality is that they were probably running 120 to 150 miles a week anyway. So the 100 mile a week is also just sort of like a talking point, right? It, it's sketchy as sticks in people's minds. But people use that to say like you don't know what you're doing, right? Which is hysterical because if you look at the level of improvement and dominance that resulted from that relative to what other people were doing at the time, it's just not valid to dismiss this stuff. But I think so many people went out and like took 100 miles a week. They've tried to run 100 miles a week and people still do this and it doesn't work. And so they get frustrated and so they have to dismiss it, right? Because the suggestion is, well, if I'm doing training 
and it's not working, the problem must be me. And that's not really the right conclusion, right? Uh, the problem would probably be that your ideas and your are shaping your ability to interpret a system, that maybe you're imposing ideas of discipline onto what that might mean, right? You know, are you trying to experience too much discipline and adversity, right? And are you, does the 100 mile a week thing resonate with you? Because you're like, well, that's got to be a lot of adversity and discipline, so that's really going to be effective. Um, and that 100 miles a week isn't a training strategy. 100 miles a week is a, you know, way to try to quantify a act of performative um, athletic volume. And that for Arthur Lydiard, like all you have to do is read his books. It doesn't say run 100 miles a week, the end. And like people, but that number is just so exciting to people too, to run 100 miles in a week. It just seems glorious. And that again, right? Traditions, entitlements, people are doing things because they like the value, um, the social value of that. To be a 100 mile a week runner starts to become about uh, doing that, right? Um, and so like what can we really say about this stuff is like I don't blame Pavo Nermi's The Flying Fin, right? I don't blame his interval training. I don't blame his sort of like sort of intensive, almost angry sounding focus on his brand of asceticism where he's constantly judging himself against his, his stopwatch. But, you know, nonetheless, stuff like that really profoundly shaped our idea of what training would be. It's sort of like that's the idea that got there first. Um, and it's just sort of been passed down and passed down and passed down um, through culture. Um, and it's incredible how permanent that is. And I think the reason maybe why that was the original interpretation is because that's the thing that looks like it makes the most sense. It's the logical conclusion, right? So our system of training, the discipline system of training, you know, isn't based on what's competitively optimal. It's based on our idealized uh, cultural, cultural notions of the value of self-discipline. And it's, you know, based on the sort of expectations um, that people had, you know, from an observe and use logic to make sense of things, right? You know, Pavo Nermi behaved in the way he behaved. And, you know, that must then be the key to that, you know, and we didn't live in a, a culture at the time which really wanted to interrogate these things. So it's not like we have an abundance of stuff where we can really hear deep, you know, reflective ideas from, from the flying fin about how he thought about training. You know, and people want that social value. And then we come back to the market thing. You know, sometimes there's economic value that comes with that. So another incentive behind the system that shapes us in athletics is that, like, you know, when you can signify that you're engaging in the system, and there's a lot of con artistry around this too, right? It's really easy, um, you know, with the internet and, and, you know, modern digital media to create myths of, of yourself doing and engaging in this stuff when that's simply not the case. Um, but, like, if you can market or signify that you are taking on the system, well, you can be economically rewarded for that, um, and it's like looking like the system's ideal, looking like an act of discipline is sometimes more valuable. So I think what we're left with is this idea that the system that shapes us, the systems of training aren't something that's been optimized through competition, but they're driven by historical um, expectations um, of culture and that the discipline concept rather than being like this key ingredient that we need to develop within ourselves might actually just be the limiting factor. All right. So in the next segment, um, which is going to be one E as we're getting closer to the end here, probably two, maybe three more segments to, to wrap up this protracted opening episode. The next segment is going to talk about kind of like the, so what of this, you know, how can we look at some examples, specific real examples of systems, and can we, like, question or, or learn about the value of those systems, learn about the lack of value in those systems, and how can we use that stuff? But I think the takeaway right now, 
at this point is now we can successfully reach the conclusion that when we're looking at what we're being asked to do, what we're asking of ourselves to do, what we're asking others to do, depending on what role and context we find ourselves in, you know, where is that coming from? Is that because we see a benefit in terms of performance or are we enacting a traditional expectation of what the sport should be, what the experience should be, and are we relying on some sort of magical purifying power of discipline? And how can we question that narrative and how can we use that process of questioning to actually expand what we can do? Because moving away from pain and moving towards feeling good might actually be the real performance enhancer here.